early one morning, the sun was shining. I was lying in bed, wondering if she'd changed at all. Her hair was still red.
Good morning. What a way to start the morning. Welcome this morning to First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen. My name is Ashley Bear, and I am the interim associate pastor. And it is wonderful to see you all in the sanctuary this morning. And a hello to all of you who are watching on Facebook Live. We have a reminder and some announcements this morning. A reminder that we are doing our best to create a safe, socially distant space for worship. Uh, we do have a church policy, which you can find in the Sunday paper. We're asking that you please sign in before entering the sanctuary. Keep your masks on while you're inside the sanctuary and observe social distancing if possible. If you are immunocompromised and you need more space, we have some limited seating at the balcony. Um, and we ask if you would like, you can call us to reserve those seats and we'll make sure you have a space. Some announcements this morning. The Presbyterian Young Women will be meeting today at 5 p.m. for a beading event. Um, some time to hang out and make some Christmas gifts. So all young women, eighth grade and older, are invited to attend today at 5. There are still some angels waiting to be picked up from the Advent Angel Christmas trees. Um, just think about how that gift may be the only gift that will be received by some senior residents and young children from the three centers that we are supporting this year. So if you haven't done so yet, please consider getting one. The trees are in the narthex and foyer of the social center. Our food pantry is hosting a holiday bazaar on Thursday, December 16th for their clients. With your support, they hope to provide gifts and bring holiday cheer. Details on that event are also in the Sunday paper this morning. And a reminder that we have an ongoing coat drive. So please share the warmth of this cold season and bring any new and gently used coats of all sizes. They're being collected and may be dropped off in the collection bin located inside the social center lobby. And today, after worship, we have refreshments to enjoy. I hear that Don and Carol Wallace are doing coffee hour today and that it's Don's birthday. Is Don here? Okay, well, if you see Don, wish him a happy birthday. And don't forget to stop by um, in the session room after worship today for coffee and refreshments. And with that, I invite Lorraine and Beth to lead us in the lighting of the Advent candle this morning. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. A choir sings in the silence, come, Emmanuel. Every valley shall be filled, every heart shall be made whole, for peace is stronger than turmoil, and love is louder than hate. As we light our second Advent candle. We pray for the holy peace of God. Come now, O child of Mary. Come now, O Prince of Peace. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship this morning. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. now before God to confess our darkest moments, those actions and thoughts we know would not bring God the joy we wish our lives to offer. Together, let us lift up our voices in the prayer of adoration and confession found in this morning's worship guide. Let us pray. God of mercy, draw us to the light, coax us from the shadows of regret, Lead us beyond the darkness of fear, for we need the light of truth to shine in us. We need to be illumined by wisdom. Remove the blinders of greed and the blindness of indifference. Let us see the great light of hope, the persistence of the dawn chasing the night away. Let us see and behold the glory of this day, the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Amen. The light has come into the world, and the darkness shall not overcome it. God did not send God's Son into this world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Rejoice, beloved children of God, we are forgiven. Alleluia, amen.
children please come up for children's time? Good morning. good morning and good morning to the children who are watching from home. So we have just finished celebrating a fabulous holiday, Thanksgiving. And now that we are in December, we're going to be celebrating another really important holiday. Christmas, Christmas of course. Or Hanukkah. Or Hanukkah, you are right. So. When I think of those holidays, I think about families. So I have a job for you to do for me this morning. I want you to count how many people are in your family. Not yet. Not yet. I want you to count moms, dads, brothers, sisters. Just those. No pets. We're not doing pets this morning. I know they're important. Moms, dads, brothers, sisters. And what I want you to do is I want you to hold up a finger for every person you're counting. The first finger should be you, because sometimes we forget to put ourselves in that. And then every time you say one, you hold up another finger. Now you can either say it to yourself, or you can say it out loud. Not screaming, but you can say it out loud. Okay. And when you're done, I want you to hold up the hand or hands that show the numbers that you count. OK, you ready? Go. Put yourself. Count how many people. Nobody's saying out loud. That's OK. Can I count my pets? No pets. No pets. OK, let's see. Wow. I see a lot of different numbers in front of me. I see some twos, some threes, some fours, some fives, and even more than that. That is amazing. All right, I'm going to count mine when I was growing up. So I had me, mom, dad, brother, brother, sister, sister, sister. Oh, I forgot another brother. Nine. I, I was a little worried I might run out of fingers, but I didn't, so that was good. So. What we see here is that our families are different. But the one thing that is the same about our families is that we love each other and we care for each other. The Bible tells us that Mary and Joseph's family is going to grow with a baby. That will make three for them. But it also tells us that not only is Mary and Joseph's family growing, but they have been given a gift from God, his son, Jesus. And what is wonderful about this more than just Mary's family growing, Jesus has come for all of us. So all of our families have grown. Hold up your hands again for what you showed me before, whatever number you had. And I want you to add one more finger. I'm going to do it too. Now our families are complete. Our moms and dads and brothers and sisters love us and care for us. And now we have added Jesus, who is loving and caring and part of all of our families. So during our Lenten season and approaching Christmas and after, please remember that our family is complete because of God's gift to all of us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for our families and also for sending us your son, Jesus Christ, to love us and care for us. We love you, God. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Our first scripture reading today is from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 10. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, This is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the land, for the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The Moabites shall be trodden down in their place as straw is trodden down in a dung pit. This is the word of the Lord.
Amen. Our, our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen for the Word of God. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field which someone found and hid. And, and then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught every kind of fish. When it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and put the good fish into baskets and threw out the bad fish. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them out into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, help us to find the treasure in the field, to find the pearl, and to bring the net ashore. Amen. The day before Halloween, I told my wife, I think we should put out a bowl of rocks as well as candy. Give the kids a choice. <laughs> Kathy gave me a look, a look that doesn't need a lot of further comment. It says, are you insane? <laughs> you know, like, like Peanuts and Charlie Brown, I retorted. I, I think it'd be fun. This idea was vetoed when she said, we're not putting out a bowl of rocks. <laughs> Maybe I was never good at being a kid. Just, just odd is another possibility. But, but I would have got the joke. <laughs> I love that Peanuts special where Charlie Brown's pillowcase is filled with rocks instead of candy. I mean, the kids do say trick or treat not really getting into the spirit of possibility if there's only a bowl of treats. You can't have either or if there's just one possibility. I remember as, as a boy, my grandparents went on a trip to Tennessee to visit my grandfather's hometown. When they got back, they had lots of treasures from the small coal town where he grew up. One of the treasures was a lump of coal. He gave it to me and laughed about Santa telling him to keep it for my stocking. Perhaps it was odd, but I love that lump of coal. <laughs> found it fascinating. I also found you shouldn't carry it around. It gets all over everything, <laughs> especially your hands and your clothes and furniture. <laughs> I'm not sure why I feel compelled to today to offer so many confessions of childhood, but, but another one is that I really believe Santa had a list. I mean, it's in the song. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's and nice. Yeah, it's in the song. Made sense to me as a kid. As with many Christmas traditions, there is debate about the actual origin of this list. Uh, legends of winter solstice spirits terrorizing children is one possibility. Cheery note. Uh, nothing like the darkest day of the year to induce fear in children. As a child, I didn't ask such questions of origin or tradition. I, I just believed. I just hoped that I was on the nice list. Protestant theology is not much of a help here. According to our theology, we are on both lists. We're both naughty and nice. Simul justus et peccator. We are both righteous and sinful, sinner and saint. Martin Luther found a strange peace in this paradox. For him and his compatriots of the 16th century, this allowed for grace to work in us. 
Well, I could see the potential of the juxtapositions of opposites as creating a more profound understanding of life. I'm just not sure it really works for the Christmas stocking. It's as if all the kids should get coal and candy. Given my lack of success at Halloween, I'm thinking I will not explore this possibility at Christmas. Better leave it to the realm of theological speculation. The temptation to speculate, theologically that is, is built into our reading this morning. The kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea and caught every kind of fish. And when it's pulled ashore, the good fish were thrown into baskets and the bad fish were thrown away. This is the third parable Matthew puts together to form a set. The buried treasure, the pearl of great price, and the the net. It's a trio. They, They go together. They are the three parables of discernment. Discernment was what binds them together. You you find something of great value, and you can see and know what is the good. But then, according to Matthew, Jesus speculates. The bad fish are not only thrown out, they're in for a world of hurt. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Scholars suggest this last bit, the the speculation of the fiery furnace and gnashing of teeth, uh, that's been added on. It's as if a scribe had scribbled a note in the text at the end of the three parables and not just thrown out, oh no, those bad fish are going to get it in the end. It's possible that this last part is a kind of warning added later. In other words, Jesus didn't say this. I bring this up not not to avoid the hellfire and brimstone. I, I think the added scribble is likely because the parables of Jesus are about living this life. And discernment, it's not so much at the end of time, but here and now. The end of the day, the naughty and nice list is is not for the end of time, it's for the end of the year. That some fish are good and some fish are bad at the end of time doesn't really work as an analogy for discernment. The kingdom of God is about real time, not end time. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, I was on a nonprofit board, a great organization called the Urban Mission. Think our food pantry dialed way, way up. While I was on the board, the mission faced a few issues. One was a bookkeeper who embezzled. Yeah. When we became aware of this, we had a bit of a debate as to the right course of action. There was the usual banter of, we're a Christian organization, can't we help this person? There were others who were worried that if if this comes to light, that people will stop giving to the mission for fear that their gifts will be stolen. Finally, the prevailing opinion came forward. This, This is a criminal act. We should turn this over to the police. The embezzling bookkeeper was arrested, and it did make the papers. Although not pleasant publicity, there was no impact on the financial support to the mission. And while we didn't seek retribution, in the end, we believed it was the right thing to be honest, even if there was consequence. As the individual moved through the court system, something came to light, though. This was the fourth time she'd been caught stealing from her employers. She worked in three local banks. I could hear your, your, ooh, yeah. And, And each time she stole money and was caught. Only the first three, 
They simply asked her to move on, fearing the damage to their reputation and not wanting to be associated with her trial in the press. I remember feeling more betrayed by the three banks who looked the other way than by the woman who stole. What I could see in that moment and what comes to the fore in the third parable of discernment is this. You must be honest about the fish. The bookkeeper who stole was not a good bookkeeper. She was not even a good thief. She kept getting caught. <laughs> she was a bad fish. The third parable is about honesty and how honesty has a purpose. And the purpose is to make sure that in our love of God, in, in our pursuit of the kingdom of God, we keep our feet on the ground. We're honest about life. The treasure buried in the field is to represent the image of God that's buried within each of us. The goodness that lies within each of us. And the pearl of great value is the kingdom of God we find here and now, the church, the traditions, the fellowship, the joy, even the music. We give up everything for them to sustain them. Very beautiful. But then Jesus offers the third as a kind of balance. You can see the balance in the debate at that board meeting when we argued about what to do with the bookkeeper who embezzled. We shouldn't judge. We should see her as someone we could help. We, we should see her as a child of God. True. We should protect the mission. What if there's, there's more damage done to people who are hungry than a few thousand dollars that's stolen? What if this hurts the ministry we're doing? True as well. We could have been guided by the buried treasure or we could have been guided by the pearl. The parables are meant to guide us. Yet what prevailed was the net of fish. Sometimes you have to say, bad fish. Sometimes you must be honest and not put off the reality of every day. Uh, that, that there is an image of God in us, this, this fabric of eternal wisdom woven by memories of God's love. We believe that's in each person. That the church is bigger than any one person. That, that this is a gift of God to be sustained with devotion and beauty and sacrifice. That's true of our church. These are great truths leading us to remake the world. We see each person as the image of God, a brother, a sister, a new creation born of faith and hope and love. And we see a, a kingdom sustained not by vengeance or greed or political threat. We see a kingdom sustained by mercy and humility and satisfied by justice, that these two great visions should not make us blind to bad fish. At the beginning of John Steinbeck's great novel, Cannery Row, he paints this picture of honesty, a, a, a discerning honesty. He does it with a knot hole in a fence. He bids you to come over to the fence and look through the knot hole. And see people who live with you. When you look through, you see that they're liars and, and, and thieves and adulterers and drunks and bums. And then he says, look again. And this time you look through and you see people who love and care and sacrifice for you. Before he tells the tale of Cannery Row, he says, you saw the same people each time you looked. Sinner and saint, naughty and nice, were on both lists, as it were. That's the truth of the first two parables. To find the buried treasure of the image of God, we must dig through the dirt 
of our brokenness, our, our sin and darkness, and, and to find the pearl, to find the kingdom of God here, we have to make our way through the market, the world. Can't search by hiding away in a religious sanctuary. These are truths to guide us. Keep looking for what is best within and without. Search the soul, search the world for what is true and good and beautiful. In our pursuit, though, from time to time, not all the time, not even very often, we need to say good fish, bad fish. Oftentimes the bad fish are the definitions we hold. When you believe you are right to hate, hate someone because of the color of the skin or their, their gender or their identity, well, that's a bad fish. When you believe you have the right to force others to give their life away and you feel free to offer nothing in return, well, that's a bad fish. Sometimes the bad fish is our actions. The embezzling bookkeeper was a bad fish. Could she become something else? Could, could she become a better person? I believe so. Was the image of God in her just as it's in us? Yes. But on that fourth time of embezzling, we need to say, well, no, no, that, that's a bad fish. I am certain the bowl of Halloween rocks would not have gone over well. The trick with the treat, I concede that Kathy was correct. No intelligent child would have been tempted to choose the rock. It's obvious. And I'm certain that fishermen would have had no confusion over what's a good fish and a bad fish. We need to be, try to be, and should struggle to be, just as clear. Most of the time, most of our days in life together, we're trying to find the treasure buried within each of us. And, and we're just busy trying to find what is good and true and beautiful in the world. It's a lot of work. Most of the time. And then, from time to time, not often, but still sometimes, we need to be honest and discerning about the net of fish, the good fish, and the bad fish. Amen.
this second Sunday in Advent is Peace Sunday. So in the season of hope and anticipation, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with each other. Friends, we are now coming to the table. I invite you to, uh, in the sanctuary this morning, we are using these two-in-one communion bundles um, for our safety. And if you're at home, I invite you to grab any sustenance of bread and any uh, nourishment of cup that you have with you. It's not necessarily about the bread and wine in itself, but about our remembrance of Christ and the gathering of these elements in communion that make this a holy moment. Friends, this is the joyous feast of the people of God. This is a loving table. This is an open table, open to all who come and to all who receive. This is God's table, not ours. The feast we're about to share is the meal of people throughout history and across the world who have come to this meal in search of God's presence. We break bread together and we drink from the cup as people who are grateful for the journey, for each other's company, and for the Spirit's guiding presence. As we prepare our hearts for this Holy Communion, let us pray together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious, loving God who is with us in this space, we take this moment to lift up prayers to you. All those on our lips and those in our hearts and those swirling around in our thoughts and unformed words. Sometimes we don't know what to pray, and that's okay. God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You hear us, hear us now. We pray for this world. At a time, God, a righteous branch sprang up, and you said you would bring justice and righteousness in every land. We pray that your peace would be manifest in every corner of the earth, the kind of peace that means people don't have to choose between rent and food, the kind of peace that means children don't have to worry about guns in their school, the kind of peace that means healing and restoration and fullness. We pray for a world where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. God, we pray for ourselves, for our spirits in a time such as this. We pray that you hear the prayers we share from the deepest corners of our hearts and minds. We pray for our community and give thanks for the opportunity to share prayers with each other. Life is complex and messy and hard to do, especially alone. And by grace, we have each other and we have you. We don't have to do it alone. Together, we celebrate the joys. We grieve alongside the suffering 
We call out in lament. We unburden our fears and anxieties. God, let your grace and peace cover us from head to toe. May we find comfort in your presence, and may the comfort we find be comfort we can share. Comfort us now and hold us in your embrace as we pray now together the prayer that you taught your friends gathered together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of Jesus' arrest, he was gathered with friends around the table, and he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way today, we take our sustenance. the bread of life. Then he took a cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. Together, let's drink the cup of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, through this meal, we join you and all your people in heaven and on earth, your friends gathered with you in longing and hope. We do today as well. As you asked us to do, we remember your birth, your life, and suffering, and death. And we remember the hope and newness found in you. You have fed us with the nourishment of life and empowered us in your spirit for today and the days to come. May we, through this nourishment, find transformation and restoration. And may it energize us for the journey ahead May it renew our hearts, mind, and soul. Amen.
within you is a treasure, it's there. It's the image of God. It's in each of us. And, and this is a, a pearl of great value that we've found together. We'll sustain it together. If we're honest. To this end, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you this day and the next and bid you peace now and always. Amen.